Good afternoon. Happy Wednesday. It's that time, the Tulip Tribe collaboration. It's grand fun here in Portland right now. We have rain and it's cool, but it's not awful. It's just perfect, absolutely perfect. So I am loving the day. How are you doing? How's your weather? How's your day? How's your life? All those things. I'm going to have fun today with the collaboration. Where am I gonna put my coffee? Let's just set this over here. We have too much stuff set out because I was preparing for the questions. So many of you sent things in ahead of time, and so I've got a list to make sure I try to get through. But you may have something in your head or you may think of something else. So bring them on and let's see if we can figure it out. I've got the full A-team with me today. Michelle's out covering for Shell. The class is underway, and here we have Carolyn and Marisa, and online we have Susie and Caledonia and David. So you got a full house. So if you stump the teacher, I'm going to turn to the rest of the team and see if we can find the answers for you. But hopefully, we'll manage to get it together. Housekeeping, remember, if you're on your phone, turn it sideways, you'll get a bigger picture. If you're on a tablet or your desktop, you can go to full screen. If you're watching me on YouTube, you might have me on the huge screen of your television. So many different choices. Should have fun today, though. If you haven't already, introduce yourself to the tribe. Hi, I'm Leanne. I'm from Portland, Oregon. Grew up in Vancouver, Washington, but have lived in Portland, Oregon now for the rest of my adult life. Who are you? Where are you? Meet your tribe create connections, because this is all about an hour of the tribe supporting each other. So let's start. One of the questions that came in was, how do you salvage a faded hydrangea? And so I sent a note over. I said, I need some dead hydrangeas. And we've got some pretty dead ones here. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to revive them or not. And then we have a medium dead, just kind of droopy. You can see they're waving around there. They've, they've faded, but they're not quite so bad as that one, but they've definitely faded. And then I have some that really aren't too bad. Well, that one's pretty droopy. And I thought this will be an excellent opportunity to share with you. Now, if you get our Tulip Tuesday, you already know this because I did this in a Tulip Tuesday a while back. Um, if you don't get the Tulip Tuesday, just subscribe to the newsletter and then you'll get that every Tuesday with a tip. And that's how you learn kind of fun new things. But for hydrangeas, if you've got them and they're really wilty like this, I do remove some of the foliage because it sucks energy from the flower. So I remove some of it, but not all of it. Then using boiling water, so you may remember this tip from dahlias. This is the only other flower that I do this with. About two inches. And we're doing this very first because I'm hoping by the end of the hour, they'll actually have revived and be ready. Maybe take that leaf off, give it a cut. I oftentimes will go both sides and then a slit up the center to really open it out and then set it into that boiling water. We'll go ahead and try these two, even though it's kind of like this might be too much. So cut, cut, slit. While I'm doing the hydrangea, what else is going on out there? Well, I do want to say, Leanne, that uh, John, Jess, Margaret, and Sharon are commenting on your RGB collar. <laughs> this was a gift from teacher Nancy many, many, many years ago. And um, it was an antique that she had and decided to gift it to me. And then I had the coordinating earrings that were my mother's. And so, yes, I thought it was kind of appropriate today to wear the collar necklace and a shout out to Nancy. Thank you, teacher Nancy, because I do love this necklace. Absolutely love it. We have quite a few tulips that are still coming in, but I'm still giving them a shout out on Facebook. I see Heather and Penny, Therese, both Sharons, Gayla, Beatrice, Arthur, Nicole, Kathleen, Elisa, 
Jim, Andrea, Roxy, Catherine, and Beth is with us for the first time. Yay, first timer Beth, I'm glad you're here. Glad you could join us. Today is Stump the Teacher, Ask Your Questions. That's what it's all about. So now, this was one of the questions that came in to me by email after I announced it last week, and they, I, they sent this to me, and they wanted to know. And so now we will let these just kind of sit here, and hopefully they're perky by the end of the hour. So help me remember, Carolyn and Marisa, don't let us forget. I'm gonna set it off camera so that it's out of the way, but we need to remember. And then I mentioned that we did the Tulip Tuesday that showed you how to do the exact same process with dahlias. And I just wanted to show you, these were some dahlias that we already did, and you can see what they look like I'm not sure it shows really well on camera, but right there is the line, and it looks like it's cut below the line, or not cut, cooked below the line. So it's kind of like cooked asparagus, and then above the line is just natural. So this was right from here to here to here in boiling water. And these are from last Tuesday, I believe, and Wednesday on the live, I boiled them. So they came in on Tuesday, I boiled them on Wednesday, so here it is a week later. Yes, they have been in the flower cooler, but aren't they still beautiful? So that shows you just how long they can last. Dahlias are great blooms if you take good care of them. What else is going on? Well, Heather wants to know why, uh, why not just use quick dip? Those actually had been quick dipped, okay? Another question, and I have my quick dip here, okay? Those actually had been quick dipped but then they still faded. And you know, sometimes you buy flowers and you get them in and they're perfect, but something happens overnight. They just didn't get cut right or they just weren't quite as fresh as you thought they were. So with a hydrangea or a gerbera, I always use quick dip. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's just a clear substance and you just take it, pour it into a little cup. I don't have one up here, so I'm gonna pretend. Pour it into a little cup, then take the stem, dip it, and then transfer it over to a normal vessel with flower food. And that's fabulous. Once they reach that totally wilted stage, the quick dip isn't enough. You have to really shock them. So that brings up a question was, when do you use which items? And they said, well, do you use quick dip and then skip flower food? Or do you mix the two? Or when do you use it? I use all three because they're for different things. The quick dip is a rapid hydrator, so I use that very, very first. And especially things like roses, gerbera daisies, hydrangeas, makes a huge difference. So I quick dip, then I place it into a bucket or a vase that has flower food already mixed. So you dip first, then place it into the flower food, and then lastly, after you make your arrangement, that's when you would spray it with the crowning glory. So I actually use all three things on most items. So yeah, you kind of got to use them all. They all three make a difference. So one other thing, since I have the Gerberas out here right now, somebody said, how do I get Gerberas? to be so strong and healthy. And look at these. They are just wonderful. And you know, as well as I do, that Gerberas sometimes get those little tipped necks and the stem is very, very soft. The trick with a Gerbera is they need to be suspended. So this is a Gerbera rack. You could use a cookie sheet. You know, a cake cooling rack, anything like that. But when you get them, quick dip, and then thread them through, and let them be suspended, and then set them down in a bucket. Now this bucket isn't truly a bucket, this is just a vase, so I'm going to use it to demonstrate, but, so you would suspend it like below, what you don't want to do is let it touch the bottom and have them come out. This means it's not going to work because their heads are still going to go icky. It has to be suspended so that it doesn't touch the bottom. And so you need a very tall bucket. And then you just let these droop like this. 
for 24 hours. And then when you're done, you can take them out and set them into the vase just like these, because these had all been suspended already. Then you can put them in the vase and you can see how perfect they are. It's just grand. So Karen Handling was where a lot of questions had come in. So if you have a Karen Handling question, ask away because there's lots of things. Carolyn, what's going on in your world? Oh, I'd like to give a, a shout out to Debbie in Georgia. I spoke with her last week and had a fun conversation. This is actually her first time joining us today on live. Debbie in Georgia, welcome. I'm glad you're here. First timers, we love you. So if you are a first timer, let everybody know and you on the tribe, reach out to them, make them feel welcome. Let them know you're glad they're here. And if you know someone who should be joining us that needs to have questions answered, tag them, share this out, spread the word. Marisa. Okay, I have two Karen Handling questions for you, Leanne. Okay. And I don't know if maybe, hmm, nope, you're working my phone. Okay. So let's see, um, Stacy wants to know, when you use the hydrangea or dahlia that has been hot, hot water treated, do you cut them above the hot water line when you start designing? I usually do, because I think that you're probably damaging those lower sections, and so I would cut that off when I design, and as I design, I do one more step. So hydrangeas are kind of a persnickety thing sometimes. So I quick dip and pray that they last. Something goes wrong, they limp, go limp and get wilty. I do the boiling water. Then when I go to design, I cut off that last bit that was cooked and I dip it in alum. So it's a little white powder. It's a pickling spice, alum, A-L-U-M. Um, we sell it on our website, or you can get it oftentimes at a grocery store in the pickling session, section. So I dip it in alum and then put it in the arrangement, and they last but longer. Yeah, it's got all these little magic tricks. Um, now, obviously, in flower school, this is what we teach, so you may already know this. But if you're not a member of flower school, this may be new information for you. So I think what I'm going to do is a little arrangement in here. And one other question that came up was, how do you soak foam? How long will the foam last? Can you store foam? All of those things. So let's kind of wrap it all in one. I've got fresh water that already has flower food mixed in. So this is water and flower food. When I go to soak foam, if I'm a busy store and I've got lots to do, just soak the whole brick. If you're making one arrangement, right now I don't know that I'm going to use a whole brick of foam today, so I'm going to just cut off one section of foam because there's no reason to soak the whole thing. Then when I go to soak, just set it in the water and let it sink. Now this dry can wait on the shelf for days, months, weeks, it's not a problem. It'll hold pretty great. It does degrade with direct sunlight, so it's better to keep it in a cupboard or put it in a bag or something. But dry, it's going to hold really quite well without any issues. Once it is soaked, if you want to store it, let's say I soaked too much and I wasn't going to use this, or I got a phone call, somebody said, come have coffee with me. And I think, ah, let's dip that arrangement. I'm not going to make it then you could put the foam into a plastic bag and set that in your flower cooler or refrigerator and it'll hold for a week or so but it is going to start breeding bacteria you only need it to last till tomorrow just leave it sitting in the water it'll be fine there but again once it starts getting wet you're going to start breeding bacteria so the longer you store it the shorter your flowers could last so i recommend just soaking what you need and then I'm going to go ahead and just put this into this container. Setting it down in. There. Get rid of the water. We don't need all of this. Might need it later, but we don't need it now. Then I don't really need this much height, so I'm going to score my corners.
and then I'm ready to design. Now this particular one isn't going to need tape because of the way it's wedged in there. It's tight enough that it's not going to wiggle, but it also is loose enough that I can still add water in here. I've got two spots where I can add water and look how huge the container is. So it's got a great water reservoir. So this is going to hold so well. It's not going to be an issue at all for a long lasting arrangement because I just would go back, fill it up with water. I could just do some of the water out of my water bottle and just pour it in there, filling it up. And the more you have water in the water reservoir, the longer your flowers are going to last. So I thought in this one, I would use the mink protea. This was left over from class. We've got basic floral design going on right now. In fact, the students are on the other side of this wall. Um, class is in session, teacher Shell is teaching. And this morning they used the mink protea and they made Bespo bouquets with it, which turned out absolutely beautiful. So there was one left over, and I thought, that one's mine. So I've got it, and I want to show you how, sometimes you want it to be a little fuller, a little more open. And for that, I use a little bit of cotton and just pull it out. So somebody had asked, how do you open a protea? And what I do is I take the cotton and I just tuck it way down inside where you're not going to see it, but it fans out the petals, makes it look fuller, bigger, more value. So that it just gives it a nice, full, wonderful placement. Then I double check. I don't want it to show it all, so I make sure the cotton is down in there. But you can see a much bigger bloom now. So that's how you open a protea. So it's just a bit of cotton, like you might get in your vitamin bottle or a pill bottle or something where they have the cotton tucked in, cotton batting if you're a seamstress. In desperation, I've used wadded up tissues before, but I think that the cotton works better, but a wadded up tissue can work. Then I'm going to use this as my focal emphasis, and I'm going to take off the damaged leaves because I don't really want those, and I want to be able to insert this down quite low. There we go. And it's so woody, oftentimes I don't use my knife, I'll just break it and then use the knife to finish it. And I've got a little bit of a nub here where the leaf is, and I may just go back and clip that off so it doesn't screw up the foam as much. And then I can just set this down in, and I'm thinking about where do I want my emphasis? And I think I want it right about here, and then straight down in. So I'll keep designing, but I want your questions. What else do you want to know? I have so many. Are you ready? Okay, okay. we'll give it a shot. I have already like 10 written down. Okay, so this was from earlier. You're going to like this one from uh, Diane. So she's saying, so cutting stems under water, does that really extend the life of the flower? Because in Ichabana classes that she's taken, they insist, no ifs, ands, or buts, that they have to cut the stems under water. That's a great question. So cutting stems under the water or cutting them in the air. If you went to flower school with me two years ago, three years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I've been teaching for a long time. But if you went to school with me in the past, we taught you to cut everything under water. And we had dish pans we'd set out, and every student would take the time and reach inside the dish pan and cut the stem and then put it in the vessel. We also taught you to use warm water for everything. We taught you warm water, cut under water, all those things. And the science has changed. And it's been roughly two years, maybe three years since it changed. And now, if you teach, take classes with me, we teach you to cut in the air. We teach you to use 
cold water. And so the science has changed. It's all new. They have found that the bacteria grows faster in warm water. So if you do it with cold, your flowers will last longer. Also, they have found that if you cut under water, the amount of bacteria in the water is much more than in the air. So, yeah, good question. You want to cut in the air, just like that, and you want to use cold water even though I just showed you to use boiling water. But the majority of flowers and the majority of the time, cold water is going to be your best and cutting in the air is going to be your best. What other questions have you got there? I have a great question. What is the temperature range, the best temperature range for your cooler? Ha, huh. okay, cooler temperature, 34 to 36 is considered to be the best. You could go up to 38. You don't want to go below 34 because you're getting awful close to freezing. I know people who sometimes get it to 32, but that makes me, or 33, that makes me nervous because 32 is a problem. So 34 to 36 is absolute best for most things. There are some flowers that like it cold or cooler, um, warmer is the one I'm trying to say. A tropical blossom at 34 is going to die. They like it to be 50 and above. But for most things, that 34 to 36 is going to be best for your flower cooler. Adding in, um, so I did the mink protea, dahlias. Thank you to Teacher Shell. She actually picked these for me and brought them in direct from the farm to make sure I had some dahlias for the lives. So a th shout out to Teacher Shell, because that's thanks to her. And then the leucodendron, just to bring in a little bit of a darker hue. So the front, it's kind of here, I think, although I might change my mind. The side fills in, and then this would be the back. So I've got to do something to the back because it can't be naked. I don't like a plain back, but I'm just kind of messing around here. Um, other questions? Um, before I get to more questions, I do want to do a shout out to um, JoLynn and Stephanie. They're joining us for the first time. And then congratulations to Tabitha, excuse me, Tabitha, who just finished the basic challenge, just signed up for the advanced online. And, and I just spoke to her. Oh, today. oh yeah. <laughs> and then lastly, Nicole, who just passed her CFD. Congratulations, Nicole, on the CFD. That's pretty exciting. Oh, I'm so proud of you. And Tabitha, I actually took a peek at your submission because uh, I was working from home and I saw that go through and I saw that there was a certificate printed for me to sign. So I went over to peek at your work and it was beautiful. So well done. I'm going to have fun working with you in your advanced studies that we'll all have fun together. And that was Nicole was the other one that you said somewhere, I think? Um, uh, uh, Tabitha, uh, Tabitha? Nicole. Or Nicole, excuse me, yes. Nicole, Nicole. CFD. Yes, Nicole. Nicole's the CFD, Tabitha is the challenge, and on to advance. And, and she wants to get her CFD, Tabitha does. Ah, so yeah, if you're, ha you're a third of the way there, because you get that basic challenge or taken, and then come back to do your advanced, and then once you do that, and prove that you've got all the knowledge necessary, we can get you situated for the CFD and do that online test, and you're moving right along. So I've added some Italian Ruscus to get a little bit of movement here, so you can see how it's all coming together. And, you know, I think maybe a little bear grass. That could be fun in here, too. I think get a little bit of softness going on. You ready for more? I'm ready for more. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to combine some of these questions together because like I said, there's a lot. Okay, um, so Elisa is wanting to know if the same technique with the Gerbers, how you suspend them, you know, in the bucket, if that can also be used with sun, excuse me, sunflowers. And then in addition to that, with the rack, can you use um, like brown paper around the neck or something, or is there something that you can use in, if you don't have the rack? Um, if you don't have the rack, go to your kitchen. Take the rack out of your oven. How often do you bake? Well, now that it's COVID, you might bake more often, but you can even just pull the rack out of your oven and suspend them through there 
and then just put it back in when you're done. Um, you could go to the hardware store and purchase like window screening and cut little holes in it, or you could use floral netting, anything that will support it. No, I wouldn't do um, paper around it because it doesn't give you enough control loosely uh, and support correctly, so that wouldn't be probably what I would do. Sunflowers, no, it doesn't work. I wish I had a better answer on the sunflowers. They drive me crazy sometimes and the suspension doesn't really work with them. And Carolyn, what have you got? I'd like to give a shout out to Lisa. I just spoke with her before we went live. Um, she was calling in to have us put her name on the CFD list. Oh, great. she just graduated advanced. Excellent, so proud of you. You know, this has been an amazing year because so many of us are spending more time at home. And so it's the perfect time for online learning because especially with our program now, with it being fully digital, you can study anywhere, anytime, 24 seven, as long as you have an internet connected device. It makes it so easy. And um, I'm just amazed at how prolific you students are being. You're keeping we teachers busy, which that's a good thing. Okay, so when you are suspending the Gerber daisies in the rack, um, would you also put them in the cooler? Yes, yes. Um, the longer and more often that you can keep your flowers cold, the better they're going to last. So just suspend them in that rack, set the whole thing in the cooler, rack and all, and they can stay there indefinitely until you're ready to use them. And then if you just want it for pretty that they're not in that, after 24 hours you can take them back out. I have several people recommending straws for their Gerber daisies. Is that a good option as well? That is a backup option that I have used occasionally if I can't get them to straighten. The thing I don't love about straws is that they can actually cut into the neck sometimes and then it shortens the life of the flower. There's that issue and then the other issue is I think they're ugly. I don't like them. So that's a personal choice. I try to not bring in personal into the whole thing, but I really just don't like the look of the straw. Um, the other thing you could do is wire and tape it. I've done that. But again, I don't like the look of that either. It's like wine, 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 wine. I prefer just to do good care and handling. Okay, how about this one? Okay, so this is actually a possible tip from Nina. So with tulips, when their heads are like hangy, she gives them a shot of gin or vodka and you can actually watch them, watch them straighten up again. You know, vodka is a nice remedy for many things. Just saying. Um, but what I have found, I haven't found it so much with tulips, although it makes sense because it has an antibacteria in it and it also has a bit of a food in it with the sugars. So vodka could work. I would just rather use it for myself than the tulips. So that's where um, Quick Dip would be my go to for the flowers and then the vodka for the martini. But um, I do know that paper whites the planted paper whites, not the cut, but you know, the planted ones that you get oftentimes in December and January that are so beautiful, but they get so leggy and they tip over and they just go and it makes you kind of cranky. Um, I have found if you water them with vodka instead of water, it stunts them and keeps them turgid and straight longer. So for that, I have used vodka on my paper whites. Okay, so Lori earlier had asked, since we were talking about temperature and flowers lasting longer in the cooler, she wanted to know if there was a way to keep iris um, from not opening so much. And then someone did mention, you know, put them in the cooler. And then um, she's saying that she does do that, but once they come out of the cooler, they open real fast. That is true. Iris open very quickly at room temperature, so that is just sort of the nature of the beast. There isn't a way to really stop that. Um, with proper processing and flower food, you might get a little extra time once they're open, but you can't eliminate their opening. Um, another thing that I didn't bring up that I should, because somebody sent me a note, what about the C, V, B, N. So it's C like cat, V like Victor, B like boy, N like Nancy. C, V, B, N tablets. Um, they're also known as Gerbera pills. And um, I believe it's Chrysler Corporation sells those. 
and a lot of people swear by them. I find that with the quick dip and the hanging, I don't need them. And so it's just one more product I don't carry. But CVBN is a good product. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not one I personally use. I use the quick dip and the rack, and that seems to do it. So I'm going to stop with this one because you can see I have my mink protea, which I showed you how to open, the dahlias, which we boil to keep them alive, then tucking everything in. And I thought, oh, I'll grab this little guy. And that reminded me that somebody said, where do you get your containers? So let's kind of chat containers for a second. Some of them I get at our local wholesaler. That's where this one came from. I believe it might be from UCI, but I won't swear by that. U like umbrella, C like cat, I like indigo, UCI. But it may not be. I don't know. I've had it for so long, I can't really tell you where it came from. Other containers have been gifted to me that I've just collected over the years, and I keep a large area. Actually, it's an entire aisle with, I think, four shelves high, two sides down. It's just containers that I've collected over the years. And that's what this one is. It was a gift from a woman who was an Ikebana designer and she gifted it to us. Uh, and that's something I would invite you to do is start collecting, find treasures that work for you. Many of you have seen me used um, the Fiesta Ware, the pottery. This was from my mother-in-law. She collected Fiesta Ware and gifted me a few pieces. And they just make me happy because it's part of my heritage, my history, and it reminds me of her every time that I do use it. Um, this one is a more current, and it was gifted to me by one of our graduates. Um, she's in China, and she had this one, and she sent it. It's got three little feet that are so cute, and then the container. You never know where you're gonna find containers. You just kind of always be on the lookout. This one, you've seen me use it in a lot of different videos probably. And I believe this one was an accent decor container. You know, so we use containers from everybody. But I wanted, the reason I set this one out, I wanted to kind of bring up that I use design bowls a lot. They're ugly, they're nothing fancy about them, it's very utilitarian. But they're wonderful in that they hold exactly one third brick of foam. So you don't have to worry about, do I measure? How big do I want? You just use a third of a brick and it fits. And then it's a nice size that then you can just set into any container. So especially coming up at the holidays where you're doing production, you could green everything up and have it all ready. And then as you're doing different designs, go grab this container, go grab a basket, go grab some pottery, whatever and then just set it in. You might want to use a bit of U-glue or floral clay to secure it, but it's stable just to go like that. So I, I use the little design dishes a lot. Again, that would be from your local wholesaler. I think we have these for sale online too because some of you don't have a local wholesaler. And where do you get a utility bowl? Things like this you can find even at a home decor or online, but it's hard to find things like this. So we do keep them in stock so that you've got those options. So that's answering the question about where do I get my containers? Because it just sort of depends and it varies. Carolyn? Well, Debbie has a great question. She's asking if you could remind us that what flowers need to be hydrated separately or sieved because of sap? Okay, good question. Um, hydrating separately. The only one that I really do a separate 100% storage all the time would be your Narcissus family. So daffodils, paper whites, jonquils, everything in the Narcissus family should be totally processed separately because their sap kills other things. Now if you're going to boil it like the hydrangeas or the dahlias or something, do that separately because you don't want to destroy everything. And then um, other than that, you can really process things together without any problem. It shouldn't be a major issue. And then as far as what gets boiled, burned, singed, all of that, if it has a milky sap, 
like a poppy, like euphorbia, like poinsettias. Those should be singed with like a candle flame. So you're actually burning the end so that it stops that from seeping out, so that it keeps it safe and long lasting. Poinsettias will last for days and days and days. That was a Tulip Tuesday. You'll find it in there. Um, and then it just gives you that ability. Marisa, what's up? Do you happen to have a liner in that? Oh, I do. I okay. should have said. I should have said that. There is a, and I don't know if I can get it back out now. Well, a Alexandra just said she notices a lot of uh, arrangements at like Hobby Lobby and stuff. The decorative containers are not necessarily intended for use with water. How would you fix that? That is so true. There are so many things that you want to use that you can't use because they're not watertight. Some, like this one, I can set a liner in. Unfortunately, it doesn't give me a huge water reservoir, so I have to be careful what types of flowers I use, but I can just set that in then and it's nice, safe, and sound. The other thing you can use is spray sealer. Um, it's like the stuff that you spray into a flatbed pickup to cover the edges and such, and it just gives you sort of this foamy sealant that then dries and it cures in like 24 hours, and it gives you a watertight. Um, if I was doing event work where I was renting containers over and over and over that didn't have watertight capabilities, I would use that. It'd be great, and it just makes it easy. Okay. What about um, submerging flowers to help with hy hydration? Does that work for all flowers? Submerging can work. You have to be a little careful because if you submerge some things, then what happens when you take them back out, there's water caught in their heads. And if there's water caught in the head, and especially with like garden roses, this can happen, it forms botrytis and it rots right through the whole flower. Look at this, guys. So these were our hydrangeas that were so droopy. If you're late to the game, if you just got here, you don't know this, but these were totally droopy. That one's still droopy, but it's a little better than it was. And then these all look fabulous, okay? So we'll check on them again when we're at the end, because we're going to get closer, and we'll just see where we are with things. And um, so I'm going to set these back over so they'll keep going. And I'm working with Gerber daisies now that have been hydrated. And Carolyn, Marisa, what else is up? Well, Julia had a great question. She's curious about anemones. Do they like quick dip, crowning glory, and all the extras? And is it okay to put them in foam? Anemones are so thirsty. Um, I'll only use foam with them if I have a really great water reservoir. If the foam dries out at all, they are going to die. It just won't work. But if you've got a good rotter reservoir, you can get away with it. I prefer anemones in plain water with flower food. And yes, I do use quick dip. And the crowning glory, it depends on the color. I don't use the crowning glory on the deep purples and the real dark hues because it looks very plasticky. It just isn't my favorite. But with the whites or the softer pinks, it doesn't show. And so then I do use it. Um, but yeah, knowing your products is, is a big deal. Uh, let's see, what about this one? Um, so Stacy says when she processes hydrangeas, if they don't touch the bottom of the bucket, they don't drink. Is that a thing? Um, they don't have to touch the bottom, but they do have to be deep into the water. They will drink without touching the bottom but they won't drink if they're too close to the very top. So they've got to have that whole stem submerged at least an inch or two to make sure that it's going to drink well. So um, something to know. And it sounds like Nikki does all three, boiling water, uh, alum, quick dip. Is that overkill? I don't think so. I think that um, my go-to is usually quick dip and alum and then if they start to fade is when I go ahead and fill in with um, the boiling water adding that extra step I don't automatically do boiling water uh, just because I don't think it's usually necessary but then there are times it is I'm trying to decide what I want to use here like oh my gosh okay 
Anything else while I'm gathering some more material? Yeah, Janet has a great question about, can you elaborate on immersing heads of ethereum to perk them up? That being a smooth, hard, plasticky face, those actually do benefit greatly from submerging. Most of your tropicals, bird of paradise, ginger, anthurium, if you just take like the a big tub, put them in face down for 10, 15 minutes, then take them out, give them a cut, put them in fresh water, they'll hold far longer than if you didn't do that step. So yes, that is one that I would submerge all the time. Every single stem I would submerge when it came in. That's, that's a definite. Using some green trick dianthus here down really low just to create some basing. And then I'm going to bring in, there, get my liner down all the way, some Oregonia, which is native to Oregon, duh, Oregonia, uh, to bring in a little bit of variegation, which picks up the yellow of the Gerberas. And then while I keep poking, what else is going on? Um, Jess wants to know, with quick dip, can that be just used, you know, just over and over, or should it be a fresh new pour? It should be fresh. I would save it up through a day. You know, like if you get flowers in in the morning and then you get them in later in the afternoon, I'd still use it. But by the time the end of day comes, as tempting as it is for budget to save it, you've introduced bacteria and it's going to shorten the life if you do that. So switching out and not continuing that is a good idea. And can Foam be frozen. Huh. You know what? I'm going to have to default to the tribe. Has anybody ever tried to freeze foam? I never have. I don't think you should, but I guess I really don't know. I know you can't let it dry out. Once it's been soaked, you can't let it dry because you can never refill it again. It just doesn't do that. The molecular structure changes. But can it be frozen and then used? is a good question. So I'm going to throw that out to somebody, somebody in the tribe. If you know that, tell us. If you don't know that, somebody needs to test that. That would be a good um, experiment. If you're homeschooling your kids, maybe it's a science project that you can incorporate with their classroom plans, because I know so many of us are homeschooling these days that it's a little more of a challenge, and that could be one of your lessons. Can you freeze floral foam? Uh, Karen made a corsage with an orchid, using orchids and hydrangeas, and both florets wilted horribly. However, it was very hot. Any tips on how to avoid that? Hydrangeas do wilt. They don't do well in a corsage. They're not my go-to for that. The only time I use hydrangea in a corsage is if I use it really, really tight tucked down underneath other things so that it's more just giving some texture and color but it doesn't really look like a hydrangea because they don't do well without water think of the root word hydrangea hydra water you know and so they're heavy water drinkers and that really just doesn't work well so um that would be my problem there and then the other flower was what uh orchid Orchids should have held. That's disappointing because um, orchids generally do hold well without water. You should be able to get a day without. Now, if it's super hot, it could be that that is the problem. But um, I would generally say orchids are good for corsages, not to worry with those. Uh, hydrangeas, bad for corsages, definitely worry with those. Would you recommend using um, crowning glory on flowers as part of the processing? I do not, um, but that is a good question too. Crowning glory during processing or during design? I tend to do it during design. It wouldn't hurt them to do it during processing. I just don't think it really is enough of a help. Um, and plus, if you put the crowning glory on it and then put it in the flower cooler while it was still wet, Chances are it would mold and you would not have them look pretty for as long and that would be a real problem. So uh, I would tend to only do it at the design stage. Do tropicals like quick dip? 
I do use tropicals and quick dip. You know, there may be a flower that doesn't like it, but I haven't really found anything I don't use quick dip on. I haven't had a problem. Going back to freezing uh, oasis, Janet says that she uses oasis in outdoor planters during the winter, and it has held up well for her. They freeze and thaw and refreeze and held up all through Valentine's Day until redoing them in the spring. Okay, Janet, thank you, because that makes sense. Because if you're on the East Coast and you do those planters and such, you're right, oftentimes floral foam goes in there and it is going to freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. So there is our answer for inquiring minds. You can freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw and it still holds. So interesting. I just learned something today too. That's why I love these collaborations because I always learn something from you. Thank you. Thanks Janet for chiming in there. Our East Coast friends, they know about freezing. We don't get that here very often so that was something new for me. Yeah and uh, I guess um, you may not want to google that because Elisa just did and she found, um, she googled freezing floral foam and she found Videos of cars running over the bricks. <laughs> okay, well that's a strange one. I won't Google that then. That's, that's just not quite what I need. We have our resident expert. That's what we needed is a resident expert and Janice can be our resident expert. And then Leanne Beatrice actually asked this way early on in the uh, live um, when we started and she's asking again so we have to answer this. What about, is there a way to open lilies quickly? Um, we did a Tulip Tuesday on that, so go to YouTube, go Tulip Tuesday Lily. But the big thing is, quick dip cut, put it into warm water, not cold, go back to warm water, and then take a big plastic bag and put it over the top, where you're basically trapping the humidity from the warm water and creating a hothouse effect and they will open a little faster. So that would be the trick with that, definitely. Now, one other thing, we got some questions that had sent in to me that I forgot about, so I'll grab these real quick um, before we move away from care and handling, because they have got some other things going on. Leatris is a bloom that actually opens at the top and then comes down. And so somebody asked, would it continue opening all the way down? And I wouldn't say all the way down, but yes, if it has a good water source and you keep it bacteria free, it will continue to open. And if this part starts to dry out and die and go to seed, then I would actually just cut that out so that that would encourage the rest of it to continue opening. So that's the answer on the actress. And then same question, gladiolas. Now they open from the bottom up. So if you're doing an arrangement and this is all they're seeing and all the colors down below may be hidden by foliage and you're like, oh, I want that to show. How do you make that happen? And many times what you can do is to remove the top and if you remove the top, it forces the bottom to open more rapidly. But ask, if you're working for somebody else, before you take the top off, ask them if you can top the glads. Because some people, once you top them, they think they're ruined and they're just distraught. You've got to make that decision. So for this particular one, if I was going to top it, I would break it right here. And then now my blooms are closer to the top plus these are going to go ahead and open out and then maybe I could use this in something else. This isn't going to open. Those are too tight. I might be able to get this one down here to open. That's a good maybe. But um, Glads and Leatris both, if you adjust the top, you can get them to open a little bit more. Uh, I know in flower school tomorrow, our basic course, they're going to be using gladiolas and each student will have to make a decision for themselves. Do they want to top them and get that strict formality? Or do they want to leave them so that they have that more curvaceous feel? And that's one of the things we do at Flower School is we give you the data so that then you can make the decision and decide what is best for you. So, other questions? Yeah. Okay, I have one. Um, two people actually um, was wondering about this. So, um, 
follow-up question about a wedding on a hot day. Um, how do you handle this, or what would you do as a professional to make sure the body flowers still look good for the ceremony if it's 100 plus degrees outside with photos beforehand? Sometimes with the flowers to wear and the bouquets, if a couple is insisting that they want that long measure of time and there's no air conditioning, it's 100 degrees, it's outside, and they're insistent that they want pictures four hours prior, they have to buy two sets because there really is no way to have flowers look beautiful at 100 degrees for four plus hours. By the time the ceremony starts, everything is going to be faded. Uh, I know one wedding I did that was just so hot. It was in California, it was incredibly hot. And we just told the couple that they couldn't do pictures that far ahead unless they bought two sets. Since they didn't want to buy two sets, they did pictures later. And the photographer was actually happy too because that meant the photographer didn't have to be standing in the heat of day for extra time. So it's a matter of educating the client so that the couple can make a decision. Do they want to buy two sets? Because there's certainly nothing wrong with that. If they really want that time, then make the investment. If they want to save the money, then adjust the time. And that way you can make that choice. Uh, then a question I frequently hear, can I put glitter on that? <laughs> can I put bling on that? Is it in style? And yes, glitter and bling is still in style. And so I wanted just to show you the easy ways to do glitter. You could use petal proofer and spray the face. You could use Super 77 3M spray glue, spray the face. In a pinch, you could use hairspray. But you know what's kind of interesting? Crown and Glory. If you spray the face with the Crown and Glory, it's wet now. I've locked the moisture in, so it's a benefit to the flower. And then I can take my glitter and it will actually stick to the crowning glory. And so you don't have aerosol, so it's semi non-toxic. And you still get your glitter. How cool is that? So yes, if you love glitter, and Wayne, this is for you. If you love glitter and you love bling, the easiest is just to start with some crowning glory first and then put on your glitter. Then another thing that I learned, learned this from Frankie Bowling. If you don't have glitter and you're desperate for an icy crystal look, use your crowning glory and then sprinkle it with flower food and it gives you a little icy crystal look. Now, how cool is that? Can I have that, please? Is that one for you? Oh, that one makes you cool. I know, isn't that pretty? So yes, <laughs> glitter can be in style. Yes, you can do it, and you can do it with a little more of an eco mind, non aerosol, using your crowning glory. Carolyn, what and have you I'd got? I'd like to share a tip on that crowning glory and glitter. If you get too much glitter on it, you can take a chenille stem and just kind of go over the top and spread your glitter out. Oh, I love that. Did you all hear? So if you get too much glitter globbed into one spot, of course, I would always be perfect and not do that. But if you or me or any one of us globbed in some glitter using a chenille stem, a pipe cleaner, I don't think I have one up here. Oh, yes, I do. In my magic drawer, you would just take and scooch it around. How cool is that? That well, is that a great work tip. With 3M77 no, it wouldn't. Colors. It would just make it be gooey. But with Crowning Glory, that would work fabulously. So, excellent tip. So, I learned something today, too. I love that. How grand. And I guess I've started my year of glitter off. So, I'll be glittery now through Christmas because that's my first day of using glitter. If you wanted to add a bling, there's so many different ways to do it, but it could be as simple as having like a diamante pin, just something like that, and then taping it onto a wire. So just having a little pin.
and taping it down. And then you could take that and just slide it into your bouquet like you were making an arrangement. And it could come up through, give you a little bit of shine and sparkle. So there's lots of different ways to do that. One thing that you could also do if you just needed the pins, because they're long enough to do some, you could just, let's get rid of the wire and pierce them right into the center of the bloom, like so, getting a little bit of bling down in the center so that that gives a surprise. So yes, if you like bling, if you like sparkle, you can do it. It's just a matter of, is it your style? Is it what the customer wants? But you certainly can, which then brings up ribbons. Somebody said, what about ribbons? What about ribbons? And I don't use a lot of ribbon just because I don't know why, just because I'm never up here with ribbon, but I'm not opposed to it. But what I am finding is that ribbon is changing. And so when I first started, you know, it might be making a classic bow with a center loop. And we teach through this in flower school, starting the very, very first week of flower school. I want to make sure that you understand how to make a bow, that you can do this. And then once you know how to do it and you practice it and you get really good at it, then you make a decision, do you want to do it? Because some places don't do ribbon anymore. But let's say you do. So you make your bow, blah, 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 blah. And then tie it with a wire. And you've got a classic florist bow. It's big and fluffy. You can cut the stems or the tails and make them a little bit more prominent, but you get the classic bow that's big and full and it makes it a gift when you put that in. I mean, that was the reason we always put bows on arrangements because arrangements were gifts. So gifts needed bows. So you always used a bow. And um, yes, you can still do that. On trend now though is a little bit softer look. So many times you might take an extra piece of ribbon and just tie a knot, just like so. Then go back and rather than doing lots of loops, just do some bigger loops, but not as many, maybe just two on each side. And then go back and instead of a wire, use that extra piece to tie it. If you go to um, our YouTube channel, so it's just Flower School on YouTube, um, subscribe, because then you'll get everything that comes in there. That's where we post all the Tulip Tuesdays. But also, if you type in the search bows, I have about four or five different bow lessons in there for different kinds. So today's bows are a little bit softer, less structured. We still do the classic bow. And I still see that a lot, but I think current and contemporary is a little bit more relaxed like this. Now I have one more thing that I had a question come in at while I grab my things. What do you guys have out there? Because we've got about two minutes maybe. I do have one question. Landon is curious if you can use leaf shine on flowers or is it just for foliage? I prefer leaf shine for foliage and not for flowers because it's heavier, thicker, um, and so it's really not a good item um, for the flowers. I, I just, I feel like it's too heavy. It stops them from going through their life cycle. So I wouldn't recommend using those. So everybody, or not everybody, many people have asked me, how do you sharpen your knife? How do you sharpen your knife? And if you have been trained on how to use a knife stone, that's the best thing you could ever do is to have a knife stone and just do it. If you haven't been trained, it's an easy way to destroy your knife. So I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I like to take mine in and have them professionally sharpened periodically, 
but in between, I still need to keep it sharp. And so that's when I use this little guy, which is actually a home kitchen um, chef's cutlery, I guess. Yeah. No, what is it? Chef's, chef's choice. Chef's choice, and it's just a home knife sharpener. And if you're really, 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 really dull, you get a knife that's been abused and such, you pop this part off and you do it over here. But usually you don't have a knife that bad, so you don't need to do this. This is like a pre-sharpening area. I always just focus on number one and two over here. And you turn it on, and it starts going. Then all you do is run your knife both directions. Following the guide, and after you do the one, you go back and do the other. So that's too noisy, but, so you do the first one back and forth, and I usually do about 10 times, and then you do the second time, back and forth about 10 times, and then just check it by cutting a stem. You should be able to cut through really well. That's what I use when I'm doing it myself, and then the rest of the time I do take it in and have it professionally done because there's nothing better than having somebody who knows what they're doing to do it up. Um, other people I know, they actually just throw away the knife and start over. I can't do that. It just bothers me. So I use this on a regular basis and then I use a professional the rest of the time. So our time is up. And so I do want to thank you. I think I got through all the questions that people sent to me. I didn't get to pricing, so we'll have to do another live with pricing because there were pricing questions that came in, but I promise you we'll pick that one up. Um, in the meantime, thanks for joining me. If you would, share this video to help spread the word, tag a friend, and let everybody know about Flower School. Join us for classes. We've got one more class starting on October 19th, and online is registering right now. But today, we had fun together. Thanks for keeping me on my toes with questions. It's good for me to have to think and answer, so I appreciate that. Thanks to Caledonia, Susie, Marisa, Carolyn, and Shell for keeping the class going, and Michelle for keeping us all on our toes. Couldn't do it without you all, and I couldn't do it without you. So thank you the Tulip Tribe. Now get out there and do